I, I will say is there are some people that believe that at the day of Pentecost is when Christ, I mean, when the church started, which I believe the church started with Jesus, you know, and so uh, this was though a day that was significant in that it was like the first evangelistic outreach uh, that was done by them after the Lord rose and they were indwelt with the Holy Spirit and everything. So, so this is important to the start of the church, the events that happen right here. And what we see is after those events on the day of Pentecost, verse 41 starts talking about how they continued to meet uh, together. And even uh, it talks about when they were breaking bread, house to house, right? Uh, we're going to break bread after the preaching. Amen. We're going <laughs> to break our bread and we're going to eat our meat with singleness of heart. <laughs> All right. Uh, the title of the, of the message is Having One Heart. And uh, I preached it. I hope nobody listened to the live stream because you're going to get a repeat, but that's okay. I'll probably say a lot of things that I didn't say this morning in Iola. Uh, but we're, I'm going to talk about having one heart. It seems very appropriate to the day. We call this One Heart Sunday. And uh, this is the focus. Turn over to chapter four, if you would. As that first church there continued on and uh, the gospel is being preached. We come to chapter 4, look at verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses, sold them and brought the price of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and, distrib and distribution was made unto every man according as he hath need. And Joses, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation of Levi and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So we see uh, these, uh, this church here was so on fire and so united together that they were like, you know what? Let's just make, every, make sure everybody, they kind of had this like social, socialism uh, mindset for a moment. Hey, let's just sell all of our possessions and make sure everybody's uh, distributed. Big difference between what they did right there, though, and socialism, okay? And I preached on this in Sunday school because uh, the idea is what's mine is yours, right? And this is something we've been taught since we were kids in this philosophy. Uh, socialism is more what's, what's yours is mine, but that's another story. <laughs> okay, so what's mine is yours. And this idea about sharing is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's uh, all it's decent human beings understand that if I have a lot and someone else doesn't have anything, I could help them under certain conditions and all that kind of stuff. But the big difference was here that nobody's being forced to do it. They just did it because they wanted to. Hey, this person's in need. This is my brother. Let me let me help them. And I've got a little extra here. And so people were selling some of their lands and and uh, and dis distributing it and all that. But the key is that it keeps going back to this idea of having one heart or in chapter 2, verse 46, the singleness of heart. What exactly is it that causes somebody, uh, two people or a group of people to have one heart and come together, whether it's marriage or uh, uh, I don't know, just whatever kind of group that you are in. And I'll talk about this here in a minute, but there are lots of people today who have this a community that has a singleness of heart, a oneness of heart. And so you might ask, like, what actually uh, is involved in that? How do you get to that point where you have one heart with other people? And uh, you might think, well, maybe it's just people that you are definitely in agreement with and you just love this this person. You guys share the same interests, interest, the same common ground. I mean, everything that you... You're just like, man, that person, we're just kindred spirits. You've heard that phrase before. We're just kindred spirits. And this is what some people think. And it makes me think about uh, David and Jonathan. Look at 1 Samuel 18. We'll come back to Acts. 1 Samuel in chapter 18. We see here where Saul's son, Jonathan, and David just really become good friends. 
And it says, And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. They were, he said, man, I just, I love this guy as much as I love myself. And he said that they were knit together. Uh, now, I don't know if you're, if I, I looked up, I, I wondered, like, does the Bible ever use the word not? Because I know knit and not are, are related. And nowhere in the Bible does, that, that I could tell does it use the word not. I think there's another word, I can't remember, uh, that means the same thing. But the word knit, that's basically what it means. And you think about somebody who's knitting yarn, you know, making hats or whatever. Uh, what they're doing is they're tying knots in a fancy way. So that idea of being knit together, hey, we're tied together. We're, we're bound together, you know, like, like tying a knot. And this is the idea here with David and Jonathan. What was it about their relationship? Why were they so close, such good friends? And, of course, uh, on the positive, I mean, uh, going along with this message, they were good friends in the, in the good sense of, being, of having godly friends who encourage you in the Lord and all that. Uh, this, this was them too. But what made that significance? Uh, what, what made that, uh, that relationship work? Look at First Chronicles 12. There's another use of that same word. First Chronicles chapter 12. Not too uh, worried about giving all the context here, but verse 17 says, And David went out to meet them and answered and said unto them, If ye be come peaceably unto me to help me, mine heart shall be knit unto you, but if ye be come to betray me to mine enemies, seeing uh, there is no wrong in mine hands, the God of our fathers look thereon and rebuke it. And he's saying there, look, if you're coming to help me, you'll find in me a good friend. Our, we'll be knit together. But if you're coming as my enemy, hey, God's going to take care of you and all that kind of stuff. So you see, there was a choice. It's like, if you help me, I will choose to be knit with you. It's like this, uh, this mindset. So I believe uh, you can see there all throughout the Bible when people are uh, in a relationship that is strong, a strong bond or whatever, it's not based all off of feelings and emotions and like, hey, I just, that's just my kind of people right there. So we're just knit together. Sometimes you see that, but there's more involved in that. And uh, uh, we'll talk about a little bit uh, about this, especially when it comes to being knit together with God's people. But if you think about that, this is true for any relationship. You know, uh, let's say you uh, you start a job with somebody, and you've got to be loyal to uh, that group of people, right? You've got to have one heart together. You're going to have to ch decide because those people aren't always going to uh, just be your best friends. Uh, the probably the best example of this would be being in a marriage relationship. Somebody decides to marry somebody. Now you can say, oh, I couldn't help it. It was love at first sight. We just fell in love. Our hearts were knit together. We just couldn't, you know, we couldn't help it. We had to get married. Well, guess what? In a couple weeks, in a month, in a year, you might not have that feeling. You might find some things about each other that, that get on each other's nerves or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? You have to choose to be knit together and to be of singleness of heart, you know, oneness of heart. This is a choice, okay? So there's some things uh, that have to be decided, and uh, we're going to talk about that, but particularly as it has to do with us as, as a church and, uh, and, and God's people. Point number one that, well, that I want to make, if you go back to Acts chapter 2, did we read chapter 4 yet? Yeah, I read that, okay. Yeah, ch uh, go to chapter 2, verse 43. It says, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Okay, that that word fear comes up quite a bit uh, when the churches are are being established, when uh, people are being added to the to the church. Oftentimes, there was something that happened there. In this case, signs, miracles, all that. And I've already preached messages on this in the past about how I don't believe that uh, those signs and miracles are something that continued. We have the complete revelation of God. Uh, we don't have to look for signs. and uh, We just put our trust in this more sure word of prophecy. But, uh, but there are, uh, at this point, there were signs and wonders being done to confirm that what these guys were preaching was true. And all the people that were watching these things and understanding, wow, what they're saying is true, they would have what the Bible would call a fear. Now, fear is something that's used in the Bible. A lot of times people don't want to think about the idea of being f fearful of God in the sense of being uh, like afraid. 
Even though the Bible talks about sometimes even the uh, fear, someone's in fear and trembling, right? Or their uh, knees knocking together with like <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, right? And, and so there's this idea of, uh, of fear. I think there's a sense in which we could even have terror of the Lord. Being afraid that now I'm not, we all know we can't lose our salvation, but being children of God, we understand, uh, like kind of like I make the analogy, like uh, if you, as a kid, if, you're, if your parents disciplined you and you were afraid of what was going to happen whenever you were confronted with, with your parents because they know that you did something wrong, you didn't, it's not like you just lived in this constant fear like your, your parents were child abusers or something like that. You just out of respect for them and out of love for them and out of and out of knowing that, hey, they're they're going to they're in control. And if I have to be confronted with them because I did something wrong, they can discipline me. There was a certain fear. It's a healthy fear that comes with the proper respect for authority. And so the first point is that if we're going to have one heart as a, as God's people, particularly as a local body here, but as God's people, one heart, we have got to have the fear of the Lord. Many people without God, without religion, uh, they can have a similar idea of being joined together, being one. Uh, I started thinking about a lot of workforces now call it like their work family. You know, their fam their, this, we, we are a family here at this organization. You know, and they're, what they're trying to do is build this camaraderie, this idea that, hey, we're together, we're a unit, we're of one heart. Uh, and so this is something that's coming. Uh, there's brotherhoods and fraternities and all that. And I was thinking about uh, uh, the fire department. I know particularly I used to be really interested and thought about even getting involved in the fire department early on and, and uh, after my, my teen years. And, uh, and I remember thinking about how they were a brotherhood. And actually, as a Christian, I remember being kind of concerned about that. Like how if they're not my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ... Like, how much do I want to really be united with them? You know what I mean? but, but you're going to go into burning buildings with this person. You know, you want to make sure somebody, he, they care about you so much that when things start falling and the smoke is getting strong and the, thing, and, and, and the building is going on fire, they're not just going to run out of there and say, hey, I don't care what happens to him. You want somebody who is bound to you, knit to you, has one heart with you, and they say, hey, we're in this together. If the building goes down, we're all going to die. <laughs> Because because I'm not leaving this place without you or something like that, right? That's not religious. Those they're not doing that because they share a mutual fear and respect of God. They just their heart is knit together for some various purpose. But as Christians, as, as believers, and then as a church uh, uh, collected together here, the way that we're going to have one heart is by being focused on that mutual bond that we have, which is, hey, we all fear the Lord. We all respect God. We want to know what His Word says. We want to know what He does. We want to know what He calls sin so we can get that out of our life. And we want to all know that, and it's based on the fear of the Lord. The Bible says that the beginning of knowledge, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or the beginning of wisdom. It says it both ways. And so, uh, and so the fear of the Lord is essential. You know, I was thinking about that. Uh, I was thinking about those fire to fire department, you know, going into building, being willing to lay down their life for their brothers in the, in the department there. And I thought about John 15, 13, it says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Like even the world would do that. And that's like the ultimate uh, display of, of love, you know, two soldiers and uh, somebody, you know, throws his, himself on top of a bomb or something to, to allow his, his uh, uh, friends and, and his, uh, uh, fellow soldiers to be able to live. He paid the ultimate uh, price, but what caused them to have that? There was something that united them. There was something that they stood for and said, hey, we're, you know, we're together in this. And as Christians, that has to be that we want to know what God says and we fear him and we want to know his word. We have the fear of the Lord. We're talking about believers here. Look at chapter 2, verse 41. And they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Okay, so these are those who, who heard the preaching, they believed that, and then they continued on in that doctrine and what have you. These are believers. Okay, look at chapter 4, verse 32. 
And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. And so these were believers who decided, hey, because we believe what the Bible says about God, because we believe what the Bible says about Jesus, about the resurrection, the things that they stood for right now, we are of one heart and one mind. doesn't mean they all acted the same, had the same interests, had the same hobbies. You know, there's a time when Paul uh, it becomes friends with Priscilla and Aquila, and it says they were of the same craft. You know, they could sit down and actually talk about tent making, and, and I don't know how, how that worked exactly, but they, they were familiar with the business. Uh, in some cases, they were fishermen that would be hanging around each other, and, you know, they could talk their trade and all that stuff. Well, sometimes that'll happen. You know, I remember uh, we've had a few people ha have come visit or whatever that were maybe in, in the IT field or, or somehow involved in, in, in computer and technology, and they would sit down and have a conversation with Brother Dick like they're speaking Greek. I can't understand a word they're saying, <laughs> okay? Because, uh, because that's, not, that's not mine. I can be like, hey, man, tell me about computers. And he can start talking, and, hey, we don't, we don't share that. You know, now there are other things that we do share in common, but other, but it doesn't matter if we had nothing in common. If we couldn't, you know, outside of Christ, if we couldn't get along, we still are united together with one heart because Christ. And that's the case with everybody in here. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, uh, my wife and I, when we got married, she was like, oh, I can't believe I'm marrying a Yankee. Right? She, con she did not consider herself. Uh, you know, uh, it, compatible for Yankees and Southerners to be uh, get, uh, uh, joined together because she was a Texas girl and all that stuff. And, and, uh, and, and it was kind of a joke, obviously. But that is true. There are people that like different walks of life, you know, grew up with this mentality, you know, grew up eating, eating certain foods, <laughs> maybe even speaking another language or whatever. But, you know, there was a, a, a commonality that we, that, that we had. And quite honestly, and this is true if you're a Christian, even your relationships, like I mentioned about the uh, fire department. Honestly, one reason I hesitated going, joining the fire department, one reason I hesitated joining the military or something like that was because you're going to be having to commit to these people who become your family. They become your friends. They become your life. And, I'm, and I was thinking, yeah, God's called me to something else. You know, God's called me into the ministry. And look, I know we all have to be in workforces and do different things with different people. But who I really wanted to be all in with were people who had the same fear of the Lord uh, that I do. And really, even in your marriage, it's going to be that way. Why would you want to go look for somebody who's not committed to Christ? Really, that was our common ground. Valerie and me, whenever we met, it was just like, hey, we are both on the same page. We love the Lord. Now, we had some differences uh, you know, she was raised one way. I was raised with some different beliefs and some different thoughts. And eventually kind of those came together. We had one heart in the, in, in the Lord. And so even our marriage relationship, I mean, every relationship you're in, the friends that you choose, I talked about David and Jonathan earlier. Why were they so strong? Well, they had a mutual love for the Lord and, the, and, God, and wanted to follow God's will. And so they kept each other accountable. They helped each other uh, to grow in the Lord. And this is where... It starts to have one heart. We first must have the fear of the Lord. And our hearts are joined together because we share a mutual fear and respect for the Lord. Number two, look at chapter 2, verse uh, 38. Chapter 2, verse 38. And Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you look at here, and, uh, and then chapter 4 as well, they're, they're, uh, they're walking in the Spirit. They're, they're staying together in prayer. Uh, you know, you're, you, you, they're having all things common. You can just tell like they're just totally walking in the spirit. And of course, again, I can't make a complete comparison to the things that were going on in that time as far as the, the gifts of the spirit. But look, God has given all of us certain gifts. There are certain things that he's given us that he wants us to do in his name and for him. All right. And if we're not walking in the spirit, we're not going to do those things. We're just going to be worried about the flesh. We're going to be hindered by sin in our life. Uh, we're going to be... Uh, uh, you know, we're not going to be focused on doing things for the Lord because we're not walking in the spirit. We're walking in the flesh. And so to be completely filled with the spirit, uh, you know, that is key to having one heart. 
It's, and, and obviously all these go together. One plays off the other. So if you got the fear of the Lord, that will cause you to want to walk in the Spirit and get sins out of your life, get things that would hinder you uh, from walking together and working together in, in the Lord to get those out of your life. Man, I, I, it's, so, uh, it's so disheartening whenever you realize people who once were with you and they allowed things to happen in their life where they're no longer uh, being led by the Spirit. And look, there's a big disconnect. It's like you still want to have that one heart. You still want to be a one family, but somebody's not walking in the Spirit. We've all got to be walking in the Spirit. He's going to lead us and guide us and direct us uh, where He wants us uh, to go. Nobody naturally keeps that fire going, okay, that zeal. That, and this is the way I hear people describe it. Like, I don't have that zeal anymore for the Lord like I once had. Well, look, it's no one's fault except your own. <laughs> I mean, God doesn't just, you can't just push a button and God's just going to naturally give you this zeal for the Lord. Walking in the Spirit has, is a choice and it's something that is, is a little bit difficult. Getting up, uh, you know, and, and deciding, I'm going to do this. I'm going to walk in the Spirit. I'm going to deny the flesh and all those kinds of things. It's a willful choice and it takes work. Back to the relationship of uh, which is the perfect relationship about being one flesh with my, my wife and myself uh, being united together and walking, you know, in a relationship that we're called to walk in. It's going to require that I remind myself regularly, hey, we need to keep this relationship going. She needs a little bit of a, a attention. I need to talk to her. I need to uh, buy her a Valentine's something. <laughs> I need to, that's all Valentine's Day is good for. Come on. And the card companies make all kinds of money and stuff like that. <laughs> right. But the reason we do things like that is because we got to keep that, that flame going. It doesn't just naturally, you know, you know what fires do eventually they burn out. And so somebody's got to keep throwing some fuel on the fire. Somebody's got to keep on uh, uh, making steps towards that. Being filled with the spirit is much like that. Look at chapter 5 and what follows this part in chapter 4 about them all gathering together and at this point they're selling land and they're, uh, they're distributing among each other. They're of one heart. And then you got this group of people who uh, clearly, Ananias and Sapphira, clearly weren't walking in the Spirit. In fact, they just flat out lied to the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. And they apparently have no fear of God and what God's going to do, you know, in, in this decision that they make. And they conspire together to go against God. And so this is completely opposite of fearing God and walking in the Spirit. You've got somebody who has no fear of God and walks in their own wisdom and in their own desires of what they want to do. Now, it makes no sense to me, but they decided by their own choice, hey, let's sell all of our property and let's take the money that we get, we'll hold back a portion of it, but we'll give it to them and we'll act like, hey, we gave everything. We don't own anything. We gave it all to you. And it will sound super spiritual, but really we kept back some for ourselves. Now the story is confusing to some people. New believers sometimes will read that and say, wow, was God mad because they didn't give everything? And the answer is no. It was completely in their power to do whatever they wanted with it. But they decided to have an evil heart and say, hey, we're going to lie about this and we're not going to fear God. Uh, we're just going to do what we want to do. So let's read. Uh, oh, let's see. Where do I start? Let's start in verse 11. <clears throat> oh, no, not yet. Uh, I guess a good place to start is verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back uh, part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing uh, in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And so God allowed them to be caught in what they were doing and allowed Peter to just have this understanding of what was going on, I guess, and was able to call them out. And of course, God ended up dealing with them harshly. But the point was, this is night and day between those who gather together and they're giving to one another and they're loving each other and they're of one heart and they're walking in the spirit. And then this other group, 
this couple that decides, hey, I don't fear God. I'm not going to walk in the Spirit. I'm going to walk according to my own uh, wisdom. Things didn't turn out so good for them. Okay, now, uh, now the people, however, after the situation, because God's always going to make sure that He is given the proper respect and the proper fear among His people. And so if, if you look at verse 11 now, it says, Great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. And by the hand of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And it looks to me what, what's being said here, because the next verse says, And believers were the more added to the Lord, Mult multitudes both of men and people. Seems almost contradictory because it's saying, Hey, nobody joined to them. And then it says, Hey, and, and many were more were added. Okay, so which is it? Well, here's the idea. The, the, here's what I get from this is that the multitude of people, they magnified them and they said, wow, those people, you know, are following the Lord and they're and, and God's blessing them and God's judging, you know, amongst them and all that. And they were afraid. And so they kept their distance. They magnified them. But the, here's the thing about it. The Bible makes it clear to, that these believers were added to the Lord. It doesn't say they were added to the church, uh, but they were added to the Lord. Which to me is great proof, not that I need any because I have a, a thousand other verses to verify this. Great proof to, uh, that you can't say, well, if they were really saved, they would join a church. If they were really saved, where are they? You know, hey, well, they're added to the Lord. That's all I know. Amen. They're not added to our church, but they're added to the Lord. And that happens sometimes where they don't join with the church, but they are believers. Okay, and they are added to, uh, to the Lord. But the people learn to fear... Uh, be, because of the fact that others weren't walking in the Spirit. Now, let me think about that. So here we are. Let's say everybody in this, in this room right now, and I hope we all are, of one heart, one soul. We're gathered together in the fear of the Lord. We want to do right. And we watch as other people say, you know what? I'm just going to do what I want to do. And they end up, you know, not coming or falling away or or uh, living in sin and something's exposed in their life or whatever, they stop coming to church and we watch their life fall apart. We watch what happens when, when a, a child of God goes astray and goes on to their own path and we watch that thing and we, we tell ourselves, hey, I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want that to happen to you. And we actually are, are, we grow in our fear for the Lord. We grow in our desire to walk in the Spirit as we see what happens to those who don't do that. Does that make sense? And so, uh, and so we want to, first of all, fear the Lord. And that's going to cause us to want to walk in the Spirit. Okay? Uh, so we're going to walk in the Spirit, deny the flesh, and allow the Spirit to work in us and to do the work that He's called us to do. Okay, number three. Finally, we look at verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 20, 42 again. Chapter 2, verse 42 says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Uh, this is super important. Now, this sounds like, uh, hey, everybody would just naturally want to do this by this point. But it's obvious that, that not everybody continues together. This is another choice that has to be made. These decided to continue steadfastly. Now, I doubt that all of them continued. I bet later on down the road, they look back. I mean, look how many times Paul gives a list of people who fell away or are no longer with him. And, and the, they talk about those who were walking among us, and now they're not with us anymore. And, and uh, this happens so much. And, and so we read this story say, hey, they continued daily, one accord in the temple, and went house to house breaking bread. And, and they did all this. And you say, hey, that's real great. Well, we don't know how many of those actually continued like to the end. Probably a lot of them didn't. doesn't mean they weren't saved. It just means they, dis they for whatever reason, didn't continue. You probably trace it back to didn't have enough fear of the Lord, so they didn't allow themselves to walk in the Spirit. They allowed sin in their life, and then they didn't continue. So these all go together, I realize that, but uh, it says here that they continued together. As I said earlier, we just don't naturally keep the fire going. We've got to decide to keep it going. We've got to keep uh, trying. And what makes the difference between those who are going to remain together and those who are going to somewhere down the road break, break with one another 
is this idea of loyalty, the idea of, hey, we are in this for, you know, in sickness and in, and in health, till death do us part. You know, this is like the idea behind in marriage. Hey, we're going to stick through it, through the tough times, through the good times. Uh, we're going to work this out because we are a family. And this is the idea of those who would have one heart and they would continue together. Uh, they've got to choose to continue steadfastly. You're not going to move me. I'm not going to, to leave you. Okay. And, uh, and as much as, uh, as much as we can, we've got to, uh, help one another to do this. And this is the hard part for me. You know, it's easy for me to say, Hey, I'm going to continue no matter what. And whoever, and I'm just using as an example, this physical body right here, okay? Whoever maybe isn't continuing with us down the road, real easy for me to be like, well, it's not going to affect me. I'm going to stick with it. And whoever's here right now, I'm fellowshipping with you. I'm one-minded with you. Real easy for me to just kind of forget about those who have parted, you know what I mean? And what they need is a way to come back, right? That should be our desire is to, to find a way to help them to get back together. We want to be knit together with them. We want them to be uh, in fellowship with us. Uh, obviously, there are some times where they made their own choices. They're never coming back. Uh, that's, that, that, is, that just happens. Okay, but if at all possible, we want them to come back. Uh, and so we have to continue in prayer. This is what they did as they met together. Uh, they also prayed for one another, and uh, they held each other accountable. Um, you know, I recently was texting somebody who hadn't come to church for a little while, and I was like, are things going all right? The response was some kind of vague, like, oh, yeah, things are going great, this and that. Yeah, yeah, you know, you still at the same job. Yeah, yeah, I'm at the same job. And I just, I got to keep pressing the issue. How are things really? You know what I mean? Uh, uh, they got the idea of what I was getting at. And then all of a sudden what comes back is, man, not so good. This is falling apart. My marriage is falling apart. I'm going, you know, this isn't happening. I've lost my zeal for the Lord. All these kinds of things. Well, this is what happens when you stop continuing. Now, I can't make everybody fear the Lord. I can't make everybody walk in the Spirit. But we've got to do the best that we can to pray for one another, keep each other accountable, and try. Otherwise, Everybody else falls away, and then you got this small group of people who are knit together, and they're one, but meanwhile, everybody else is, is falling. We want them to be uh, united together as well. All right, so this is a cycle that has to constantly be, you know, refreshed. Fear the Lord. you got to remind, remind, be reminded of who God is and what He expects of us and what will happen, you know, if we go astray. Or even from a positive pers perspective, hey, why is it that I keep doing this? I do want to live for the Lord. I do know he wants, He's going to reward us for, the, for what we uh, sacrifice and what we do for Him. I mean, all these things keep us going. And then we walk in the Spirit, and then we continue steadfastly. This is a cycle that we've got to come uh, complete. Now, let me close with Colossians chapter 1. And see if you can kind of see here. an example of all the things that I was saying here in the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is, uh, I got to find my place, sorry. The Apostle Paul is a great example of somebody who cared about uh, his fellow brothers and sisters. All right, now, now he was in a little bit of a different situation because he was out there, maybe we would call it church planning, you know, preaching the gospel and getting people saved, going to these other towns. Sometimes he would spend as much as a year or two years with one group. A lot of times, not even that much. It seems like just maybe a few weeks or whatever. And then he'd travel to this other. Uh, he was always on the go. So he didn't necessarily always uh, have just one body of believers that he was one with. But you know what? He had a he had one heart with all those different churches that he had started, and he and you can see it just pouring out his heart in these letters that he writes to them, for these individual churches. And he's like, man, I I just I want you to be of one heart, and I love you, and I pray for you daily, and and uh, he's just really trying to hold them accountable, and he's going back, and we see this here in the book of Col uh, 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 of Colossians as he writes to the church of Colossae. Uh, let's let's start reading some of this. Uh, Colossians 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, 
Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God our Father of uh, God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of, uh, of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you, as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Apparently this was a man, as, as, Peter, as Paul would often do, because obviously they couldn't email each other or send each other a text or whatever, so he had somebody that would actually deliver these messages. Uh, sometimes it was Timothy or Titus, and sometimes uh, these various people, they would deliver that message. They would stand, stay with that group of people for a little while. They would send back a message and give word about how things are going there. And this is often how, how Paul would do. He would send people to these different churches. And he says, He is a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now look at chapter 2, and you'll notice that Paul actually didn't even meet together with these folks. He just had kind of started that church. He knew the people that were there. He was keeping in communication with them. Uh, but he didn't even meet with together with them regularly. Uh, so, I mean, it, it would be kind of like me in Iola, you know, praying for you guys here. And I didn't even see you guys as much as I do. But I'm like, hey, one of these days I'm going to come down. I'm going to check on things. I'm going to see you. But in the meantime, I'm praying for you. I want you to know I love you. And, and, uh, and it, it would be something similar to that. Look at uh, chapter 2. Verse 1, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You see... I think that he had this very idea for his brothers and sisters in Christ to be knit together with them. It required that we continue in the fear of the Lord and wanting what he wants in our life and wanting uh, what, what, all those mysteries and the treasures that he has for us. <clears throat> we got to walk in the spirit and we got to continue uh, work on ourselves and, and keep ourselves in, the, in, in Christ and doing spiritual things. And then finally, we've got to continue steadfastly. And, and, and that's only going to happen if we pray for one another, we keep each other accountable, we, we look after those who, uh, who are struggling in their lives or whatever, and we steadfastly say, hey, you know what? I'm knit together with you. I'm one with you. I'm joined together, and, and, and I want to see, see you do right. Uh, the idea uh, should always, it should always be our desire to see uh, our, fellows, uh, our fellow brothers and sisters when they get away from the Lord, uh, you know, or they're struggling or whatever. It should always be our desire to see them come back. And we've got the, uh, a will and a desire uh, for them to do right. Unless, like I said, there's, you know, obviously there's some cases where that can't happen, but uh, they're probably at that case not. Anyway, that's, <clears throat> that's another message for another day. But, but it's important that we, we do this and we have one heart together. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would uh, just bless this group of folks here. Uh, bless our church, uh, both those who assemble in Iola and those who assemble here. And I pray that you'll, uh, you will help uh, us to be knit together and to be one. And I pray that you'll help us to hold each other accountable, pray for one another. And, uh, and Lord, I just ask that you would bless uh, this day. Thank you for those who come and this, even in the bitter weather, and we understand why some couldn't come and 
and uh, the, the hindrance that was there. But I pray as, as soon as possible that you'd bring us together again and help encourage us, Lord, and help us to uh, stay faithful uh, for the short time we're on this earth, uh, uh, following you, laying up rewards in heaven. And I pray you be glorified by our lives uh, and, and uh, that you would help us to bear fruit in, in your name. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.